There's just something calming about the Tennessee mountains at dawn. That morning, as I headed to work into the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, mist was rising off the Appalachians. It was a cool autumn day. Early November, the leaves were showing off like a bright, messy painting. I was supposed to follow up on some peculiar reports about unusual footprints near Klingman's Dome. Loving nature and working as a park ranger means I get roped into all sorts of odd jobs. And this day was no different. Some people had been trying to squash the Bigfoot rumors, saying they were just hoaxes. But when some experienced hikers showed photos of huge, human-like footprints, we started to worry. We weren't just curious. We had to make sure the park visitors were safe, in case there really was some unknown creature out there. So there I was, early in the morning, hiking up to the dome with a ton of coffee and just as much curiosity. The day began quietly. I was ready for a day of footprint investigation, hoping to dismiss it as a prank or maybe blame it on a large black bear. Unusual, but plausible. As I neared the location of the reported footprints, I kept my eyes on the ground, scanning each patch of earth. Birds were chirping in a steady beat, kind of like a morning lullaby, as I looked around. My gaze found odd divots in the underbrush, trampled flora that seemed out of place for the area. It was strange, especially with everything else in nature looking so orderly. I got lost in exploring, moving higher up the path and paying attention to every little thing. As I journeyed on, there was an occasional sudden rustle, loud enough to break me from my thoughts. I dismissed it as a startled deer or rabbit, common enough in these regions. Yet something tugged at the edges of my mind. It was all too frequent, all too consistent. The wind felt chillier, the morning sun doing little to dispel my unease. The early morning exploration had turned into midday examination. I found the footprints. They were far larger than I had anticipated from the photos. A clear, deep impression of a colossal foot in the damp, rich earth. Its size alone ruled out the local wildlife, and the tread pattern didn't match with any shoe print I'd ever come across. I'm not one to jump to assumptions, but the footprints introduced a mystery that I wasn't sure I was equipped to solve. Later on, I noticed something else, a new smell. I noticed a strong, moldy smell in the air, like rotten leaves you'd find in an old attic. It was a new addition to the previously fresh, earthy atmosphere of the forest. Thought it might be a dead animal or a bunch of mushrooms nearby. Certain types can have strong smells if there are a bunch of them together. With every step, the rustling sounds, strange footprints, and that weird smell started to form a story in my head. I wasn't just following weird clues anymore. I was on the trail of something big, something unknown right here in the Smokies. As the sunlight began to fade, I decided to delve deeper into this unfolding mystery. My world came to a standstill when I spotted an immense figure lurking in my peripheral vision. Then, the leaves rustled, shattering the quiet evening. The musky scent grew overpoweringly strong, mingling with the chilled evening air, turning rancid. As I turned toward the source of the sound, my eyes met a sight that I can't shake off till this day. There it was, a few feet off, kind of hidden in the shadows. An imposing figure, comfortably over eight feet tall. It was huge, a massive shape in the fading light. I could see its teeth shining in the low light and its eyes, full of curiosity and something like anger, watched me. My heart pounded fiercely in the numbing silence that followed. It stood there, observing me with its deep-set eyes, a type of intelligence evident behind its gaze. It grunted and looked kind of familiar, but also so strange. I couldn't wrap my head around it. A wide footprint near the figure, much like the ones I had been following all day, made it clear. It was indeed the creature responsible for leaving behind the collection of monstrously large footprints. I couldn't make heads or tails of it. My science brain just went fuzzy. Just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature retreated back into the fog, vanishing in an instant. I restrained myself from chasing after it, standing still as I heard it send out a chilling, long howl. I stood there, my senses overwhelmed by the surreal experience. As I descended the path, 
The silence of the night consumed the forest once again. Something had shifted in the countryside that I had loved since childhood. Now, it bore a different mystery, a testament to nature's ability to surprise us. The long howl continued to echo in my mind. The footprints, the rustling, and that giant figure. It all made sense now, but it was still hard to believe. This was so different from anything I knew about nature, and it left me feeling unsettled. As I cast one last glance at the darkened expanse from where the figure had disappeared, I realized that the wilderness of the Great Smoky Mountains had divulged one of its deep secrets, giving me a peek into its truth. As my mind wrapped itself around my encounter, I was left with a deeper respect for the wilderness than ever before. It made me realize that there are still secrets and stories out there, waiting for the brave to discover them. I was doing a routine check in Michigan's Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. Up here it's all trees, rivers, and mountains as far as the eye can see. Out here, you don't have many folks knocking on your door for conversations. It's mostly just you in the woods, pure solitude. You see why I chose the life of a park ranger in a park that's not huge and famous like a Yosemite or Yellowstone. It was mid-November. It's when the trees have completely lost their leaves and everything goes quiet. The sky turns gray. I remember that a chilly wind was shaking the tall pines that day, making them sway. This time of year, everything feels kind of magical and peaceful. I love these routine checks. Some might complain about the cold, the isolation, but not me. I found peace here, alone with nature. It wasn't just quiet. I felt like I had a real purpose out there. It was my responsibility to keep this wilderness safe, to see that the balance was undisturbed. My duties that day were pretty standard stuff. Check out some trails, remove any fallen debris, ensure the bear-proof bin stood upright. Those kinds of mundane park ranger tasks. But something changed as I moved deeper into the park. The quiet started to feel creepy. There was a heaviness to the air that was disturbingly unfamiliar. I noticed some trees with their bark all scratched off in a weird vertical way. I also noticed a large uprooted tree laid across one of the trails. Everything about it was just off. When you're always in nature, you get to know its rhythms and signs. Even when nature seems off, it's usually in an ordinary way. In all my years, these signs were anything but regular. The silence was even deeper around these parts. Usually this deep in the woods, the sound of critters teeming in the underbrush should reach your ears. But there was nothing. Going further, a horrible smell hit me. It was like something rotten and damp. It reminded me of a hunter's forgotten kill, that kind of rotting smell. But there was no sound of a shot, no sign of people in this wilderness for days. As I reached a clearing, a deep, resonating growl echoed around me, a low, sobering rumble that sent a shiver down my spine threw my senses into high alert. It was a sound no park ranger ever wants to hear, a warning from a creature unknown. I was trained to handle encounters with bears, cougars, even the occasionally lost wolf. This growl, it was different. It lingered in the air too long, not like a normal echo. Whatever made it was no ordinary wild creature, but this was something else. The growl had a mean guttural sound to it, something I'd never heard before. I grabbed my rifle, my heart racing, but my hands were steady from years of training. I stood there in the clearing, trying to see through the setting sun and the growing shadows. I knew that the wilderness I loved so much held a creature, the likes of which I had never seen. Then, through the gloom, I saw two flickering yellow lights. It looked like eyes. Those glowing eyes scared the heck out of me. A primal fear hit me, scared of what was out there in the shadows. With heart racing and every sense on high alert, I realized that I was not alone, and that the anticipated routine check was not going to be as mundane as I believed it would. As the growl's echo faded into the sound of the leaves, I knew there was a big secret in this wilderness, my wilderness. The rest of the day was shaping up to be quite the adventure. I braced myself. I was about to come face to face with the beast of the porcupine mountains. All of a sudden, 
the sounds of the wilderness just came back, louder than before. Squirrels chittering, birds echoing their evening songs. But then, I heard something rustling through all that noise. It wasn't just the wind in the leaves. This sound was different, more deliberate. I took careful steps towards the sound. The smell of the wilderness replaced by that putrid, rancid scent, like something was rotting. As I moved past the edge of the clearing, my eyes landed on the strangest sight. It was a creature, a monstrosity standing tall, hunched at its broad shoulders, its stout covered with coarse, thick fur. It wasn't a bear, it was too wrong for a bear. It had a muscular body, with legs kind of like a dog's, but it stood up straight in a weird way. And it was tall, towering over me even from this distance. I'd guess it was about seven or eight feet tall. It had a massive chest, like it could easily take down a bear. Its arms powerful, ending in elongated fine fingers, tipped with sharp claws. I'd never seen anything of this sort, didn't even know anything like this could possibly exist. Its face is what remains etched into my mind, a long, pronounced muzzle with a scarred face, yellow eyes gleaming sinisterly. It had a furrowed brow, deep-seated eyes, and a snarling lip that revealed jagged edges of white. Its eyes looked almost smart, scanning around, shining a creepy yellow in the dim light. But the scariest part was its snarling mouth, drooling and full of sharp teeth. All my training just vanished when it howled, a sound that made my bones chill. I panicked and started backing up without thinking, snapping a twig under my boot that sounded really loud. It turned, its yellow eyes slowly moving from scanning the wilderness to looking directly at me. I can't even describe how scary it was. It was like every nightmare rolled into one, but I stood my ground and aimed my rifle at it, hoping my hands wouldn't shake. Then. After one last howl, it just turned and leaped away, disappearing into the park, leaving me alone in the tranquility of the wilderness again. When I grabbed my radio, maybe just to hear another voice, I knew no one would believe this. My post-encounter days were filled with research, trying to decipher what I had come across, wrestling with the realities of the creature that had invaded my beloved park. The wilderness had shown me something new, something I didn't want to explain, not even to myself. I knew it was a dogman, and thus, life went on. But the tranquility of my wilderness visits was forever laced with a lingering hint of wariness and fear, a memory of haunting yellow eyes, rustling sounds, and a horrible stench. I still do my job, even though I still have the fear in the memories. It happened under the wide open skies of Big Bend National Park in southwest Texas, near the winding Rio Grande. This was a while back, about three years ago, but it's etched in my memory so vividly that it feels like yesterday. You see, I'm a park ranger at Big Bend, patrolling the park at night, making sure all is in order. Out there, the night reveals a different side of itself. The sky is full of stars, and the only sound is from the nocturnal animals. It's quiet and so peaceful it can feel a bit eerie. It feels like you're in another world, awake while everyone else is asleep under the moonlight. You're always on edge, listening and waiting for anything odd in the night. On patrols, my duty is straightforward. Check for signs of illegal activity. Monitor the park for anything that seems out of place and ensure the park's boundaries are secure. But that night, something was off. It was strange. It all started with an uncanny silence enveloping the park. The usual noise of the critters that filled the desert nights was gone. The only thing I could hear was my patrol vehicle's engine rumbling and its wheels crunching the gravel-laden road of the park. To be honest, this quiet in the middle of the night gave me the creeps. Shrugging the eerie silence off, I ventured further into the park. Now the solitude of my patrol could be overwhelming sometimes but it also offered an introspective calm. Then suddenly, this creepy high-pitched screech made my hair stand on end. I got this cold feeling in my stomach and instinctively reached for my bear spray. Swallowing hard, I steered my vehicle towards the terrifying. 
The sight of a massive black shadow cast on the dirt path in front of me left me paralyzed. It was bigger and stranger than anything I've ever seen in Big Bend. Or anywhere, really. A massive body towering easily over six feet cast a dark, unearthly silhouette in the dusty orange glow of my headlights. Feeling a bit sick, I turned off the radio to hear better. That's when I saw them, the eyes. Two large reflective red orbs, attached to what could be discerned as a head, and they were glaring straight back at me. The look in those eyes was so penetrating, so unnerving that I could feel my heart galloping in my chest like a wild stallion. Suddenly, the creature stretched out what looked like huge wings, breaking the night's silence with a screeching sound. Its wings glowed a weird red in the light of my headlights, casting a huge shadow on the ground. Any normal person would call me crazy for describing this thing, but I know what I saw. In the dark, desolate outskirts of Big Bend National Park, under the eerily beautiful Texas night sky, I came face to face with something that was unlike any animal or bird I had ever seen before. A creature that I'm now convinced was a mothman. I'll never forget that night. It was like a weird, chilling dream. My heartbeat echoed in my ears, drowning out the silence. I was gripping the steering wheel hard, and I couldn't stop staring at this huge, shadowy thing that was unfolding massive wings, fluttering in the wind, its eyes staring right at me. I just sat there in my patrol car, couldn't even move. My breath caught in my throat. Then, in a flash, it shot up into the sky with its wings catching the light from my headlights. When it took off, it left everything so quiet and still. It was creepy. I was just stunned. Watching it vanish into the night, my heart beating super loud in the silence. I tried to see it again against the stars, but it was like the night just swallowed it up. Then I heard this eerie scream in the distance. It just confirmed all the weird feelings I had. It was the same dreadful sound that had first alerted its presence, the noise now resonating with a strange familiarity. There I was, alone, in what was once a peaceful place, now feeling totally creeped out. Big Ben, my haven, had unveiled a horrific secret to me that night. As the silence returned, I felt an odd combination of relief, confusion, and an insurmountable anxiety. What was that creature? What did its appearance mean? And most importantly, why was it here in Big Ben? Subsequent nights were filled with a sense of anxiety. Every shadow among the mesquite trees or screech in the night brought back images of the deathly creature. I found myself replaying the encounter over and over in my mind, realizing that although the night was very familiar to me, I was still a true outsider when it came to the core of nature. The nocturnal wildlife usually held its secrets, but that night, I had been a witness to one such secret. Talking about it didn't seem to help much. To everyone else, my Mothman seemed more a folklore story. But I knew what I saw. I had stared right into its eyes, and that's all I needed to become a complete believer. My life took on an uncanny rhythm after that filled with a host of questions and eerie recollections. Many times I contemplated about leaving my job behind and moving on from my work in the park, but Big Bend was still my home, despite the secrets it held under those beautiful, terrifying nights. In fact, the truth is that the encounter only heightened my respect and fascination for the wilderness and the unknown it masked within its ghostly silence. Every night since, under the watchful gaze of a million stars, I've continued my patrols with a renewed sense of cautious wonder. The best way to describe how I felt then, and sometimes even now, is a weird mix of fear, dread, amazement, and wonder. The park and its eerie nights will never be the same for me. I was out near Grinnell Glacier, doing my regular inspection of the trails. Out here, it's all about respecting nature. You treat her right, she treats you right. Sounds cliche, I know, but it's true. Being a park ranger in the Glacier National Park has always been my dream. Every day is an adventure with so much wild nature around. On this particular day, I woke up to see that a storm was rapidly rolling in from the west. The sky filled up with dark clouds, all orange and red. 
I could already hear thunder rumbling in the distance. I wouldn't normally head out far in this weather, but there was important work to do that day. The trails needed to be checked for fallen trees and rock slides, checking for whatever the past storm might have thrown at us. Lightning storms can cause havoc on the trails, especially with all that exposure in certain parts. So I headed out to my assigned area. Right off, I noticed a fallen tree, probably about eight, nine feet tall. That tree was an old timer, and it looked like the weather finally got to it. This job teaches you how fast things can change. As I took one last look at the sky, a bolt of lightning split the air, illuminating the rapidly approaching rain. I figured I'd better give up, head back, and reevaluate later in the day. I took one last look at the fallen tree. The bark was all rotten, with holes that kind of looked like a face, and something like antlers sticking out. But as I moved ahead to one of our ranger cabins, a sickening stench filled the air. The smell of death, rot, like meat left out in the summer heat for too long. That awful smell just hung in the air, couldn't shake it off. Crouching down next to the offending tree, I noticed a patch of rotting wood. The ground around it was dark and mucky, like something dead was there. There was something odd, something unnatural. Anything out of the ordinary in a national park is a red flag. That's when the lightning lit up again, and I saw it. Something huge and terrifying, as tall as that fallen tree was, maybe even taller. It stood erect, like a man, but its shape in the ashen darkness was skeletal, like the structure of an elk or a deer. Its form was unclear, nothing more than a black silhouette against the bruised sky. Stuck between a storm and this creepy figure, I really felt how real everything was. Is this real? I found myself thinking. They say curiosity kills the cat, but out here you can't let fear win. Maybe it was foolish to dive headfirst into the unknown, but I've always been the type to just go for it. So, with all the courage I could muster, I moved towards the huge figure. Park radio at the ready. Suddenly the wind picked up, whistling in a way that sounded almost unnatural. My heart pounded rhythmically against my chest as the rain pelted down harder. Even in the fury of the swirling storm, the rotten stench of decay clung to the air, refusing to be washed away. I took a deep breath, tried to look brave, and pointed my flashlight at the figure. The light barely cut through the storm. I noticed the thing moving, swaying a bit like it was struggling in the storm. I quickly pulled out the radio and pressed the transmit button, trying to swallow my fear. This is Ranger Mike. Does anyone copy? Over. The only response was the crackling static that melded with the roar of the storm. Tried again. No answer. I was panicking but had to stay calm. Ranger's code. The sky suddenly lit up again, a blinding white flash illuminating the vicinity. As the light faded, I caught my first real glimpse of the figure. It had this decayed, stretched skin over long, bony limbs. The skull-like face with eyes that glowed an eerie yellow in the dark. Holes staring back with an unavoidable dread. It was monstrous. One sight I will never forget no matter what else happens to me. Everything seemed to stop for a sec, and I couldn't even breathe. It was like something out of a nightmare. Really grotesque. It just didn't belong here. But part of me was weirdly fascinated, wanting to watch and understand it. Suddenly it took a step towards me an unearthly sound escaping what I could only assume to be its mouth, a deep chilling groan that resonated in my very bones. That sound snapped me back to reality. I needed to get out of there, take shelter and find help. I gathered all my courage and ran. I ran, sliding down muddy slopes and ducking under low hanging branches, refuge not even a minute away. One quick look over my shoulder confirmed that the figure wasn't following. When I finally made it to the shelter of a nearby ranger cabin, I locked the door, heart pounding in my chest. But in spite of myself, I looked out the window, back at where I had left the figure. Nothing. There was nothing there anymore. The storm eventually lessened, and the radio crackled back to life. But I was silent, processing what just happened. Was what I experienced real, or was it a trick of the storm? I wasn't sure if I should even report it. Would anyone believe me? After what felt like an eternity, 
I finally picked up the radio. This is Ranger Mike. Do you copy? Maybe that was the test. Maybe this was nature's way of showing me the things we don't usually see or talk about. The whispers of cautionary tales that the elders once told. I had always considered them nothing more than stories. But now, let's just say, I have a renewed respect for the wild. A few years back in late summer but nearly fall, I was drawn to Shenandoah National Park. It's really beautiful there, especially around Skyline Drive. I'm a bit of an amateur investigator, always looking for something unusual or unexplained. My scanner picked up reports of weird noises from deep in Shenandoah, and that got me really curious. Strange noises in a notoriously remote location. Some locals also reported weird stuff happening. Noises they couldn't quite place, not exactly animal sounds, but not human either. Some said it was like a clicking sound echoing against the empty spaces of the forest. I figured it was just another weird nature mystery, but my mind was piqued and I knew I needed to head out there or I wouldn't be able to stop thinking about it. I arrived just as the sun was setting. It was really quiet, the kind of quiet where it feels like the forest knew something was wrong. All geared up and flashlight in hand, I headed into the woods. The trees stood silent and tall, almost like they were watching me in the moonlight. I let my recorder run, hoping to catch whatever strange noises were raising alarm bells. As I trekked deeper, the noises of the outside world began to fade, replaced by the quiet stirrings of creature nightlife and the still motions of the forest. It looked otherworldly, but I've learned that looks can be deceiving which kept me focused. Some may find the silence of the forest unnerving, but I always find it somehow peaceful. Away from all the noise and busy life, it was so silent I could hear my own heartbeat. I know it's a cliche to say that, but it really doesn't get more true than that. But that night was far from peaceful. The deeper I went, my scanner started picking up static, almost like something was breathing into it. There was something disconcerting about that noise. Or perhaps it was simply my imagination, heightening the fear factor. Hours went by, just me and the sounds of the night, like hoots and howls. And then, all of a sudden, my scanner went eerily quiet. I could still hear it rolling, picking up the ambient chatter of the forest. But those ragged breaths and strange clicking sounds, they disappeared. The silence in the forest felt heavy, and I felt like I was waiting for something to happen. But what? I wasn't sure, and it was right at that moment when I heard it, a low, raspy, inhuman sound like a deep moan. A chill crawled over my spine, and it felt as though my heart grabbed onto my ribs and refused to let go. I swung my flashlight around, the beam dancing over the trees, logs, shrubs, and rocks. Part of me thought I should keep going, but another part was screaming to turn back. I've never been one to listen to that kind of sense, though. I spun around when my scanner started crackling and buzzing like nails on a chalkboard. And then I saw it. Something dark at the edge of my flashlight beam, flickering weirdly. It was hard to tell what it was at first since all I saw was a silhouette of something jumbled up, low to the ground. Then I saw its eyes. Its eyes were like two big black holes, just staring at me without blinking. Where its nose should have been was just nothing ending suddenly in a gaping, slightly open mouth. All of a sudden, it moved. I can't say it ran. Instead, it crawled. But crawled isn't quite right. It was way too fast for that. I was paralyzed for what seemed like an eternity, but was probably only a second. I scrambled back, my heart hammering, thinking that if this thing really wanted me, there was no way I'd outrun it. But I had to try. I bolted, adrenaline pushing me as I ducked branches and jumped over roots, never daring to look back. My flashlight swung wildly in my hand, flashing glimpses of where I was running. I somehow navigated back toward my car, and as the ground beneath started to even out, my fear subsided. By the time I slammed my car door shut and sped away, I started to feel better. Once I was driving, the adrenaline rush faded, but it left me shaking and gasping for air. I didn't stop until I was miles away, back on the highway for a bit, 
and then pulled over at a gas station to clear my head. What or who was that creature? I'm not so sure. In the days that followed, I tried to pretend it was a wild animal or maybe a trick of the light. But still, I can't get those eyes out of my head or how unnaturally fast it moved. People always say there are creatures in the forest we haven't seen or don't know about. But what if some are meant to remain that way? What if there are things out there that have evolved to avoid our sight? Things that are better left undiscovered. But even after all that, I'm still curious. If anything, it's intrigued me. I'm no closer to the answer, and the question continues to linger. But I'm confident that I'll figure it out someday. I found myself standing in the lobby of the Jerome Grand Hotel in Arizona. It was really cold that night, the kind that gets right through your jacket. If I'm honest, as an outsider to Arizona, I wasn't expecting this kind of cold. Last time I was here, it was so hot, I thought I'd melt. So this time I was there more out of curiosity than anything else. Ghost hunting was a hobby of mine, and I was eager to see if I'd run into any spirits that night especially the one whose story I'd come to know as the ghost lady of Jerome Grand. But my thoughts were quickly interrupted by our guide calling everyone to gather around him. We were about to start a full night tour of the hotel, and I was already getting antsy with anticipation. Now, a haunted tour under moonlight had its own unique charm, but a tour of an old building with a history that was both fascinating and somewhat gruesome. Well, that was an experience hard to resist. The place felt like it was full of stories, what with the high ceilings, creaky floors, and old peeling wallpaper. The place had a weird smell, kind of musty and old, but with a weird hint of flowery perfume. As we traipsed from one room to another, the guide regaled us with the stories of the past. Each tale was more intriguing than the last, keeping us hooked and on edge. A tragic accident here, an unexplained death there, and events that just couldn't be rationalized. It felt like their stories were still hanging around, making every shadowy corner seem like it was whispering secrets. Then we got to room 32. You know the one they say is haunted? It had this cold spot and a weird smell. The guide's words echoed in my mind. The Jerome Grand Hotel was originally a hospital, built in 1926, and room 32 was a patient's room with a history of more than a handful of deaths. Suddenly, the wallpaper seemed a little grayer, the air a bit heavier. We were huddled in the small room, soaking in the icy chill that seemed to wrap around us, making the hairs at the back of my neck to stand up. Even with the cold outside, the chill in room 32 was something else. It got right into your bones. It was not a natural cold. Something about the room felt off. Leaving the room, I couldn't resist one last look back not wanting to be the last one out. In my eagerness to experience something truly spectral, I had lagged behind the group. In the dim light, I swear I saw something, like a mist or a fog on a mirror. The scent of perfume, stronger this time, seemed to linger in the air. I figured it was just my imagination running wild after all those spooky stories. I had no idea what was coming that night. Feeling both excited and a bit scared, I kept going on the tour, hanging back a little from the group. I felt really curious and found myself heading towards a part of the old hospital wing that guests don't usually visit. In the dim light and shadows, I caught sight of something out of the corner of my eye. Looking more closely, I saw a vague form in a mirror mounted beside a weather-beaten cabinet. Around the corner, past an old wooden door, I saw a lady's reflection in the mirror. She was wearing this old Victorian gown like something out of a history book, and she looked kind of transparent. As I blinked, she disappeared from sight, almost as if she'd never existed in the first place. I rushed to the mirror just to find my own startled reflection looking back. I could still smell the vintage perfume in the air, now growing faint, and I felt a cold breeze pass by me. And remember, there were no windows around there. The next few moments were a blur, I remember running back to the group, tripping over my own feet in a panic. I didn't want to be alone with the ghost, even if she was the long-forgotten Lady of Jerome Grant. 
When I got back to the room with the group, everyone suddenly stopped talking. I must have looked wild, wide-eyed and panting. I saw her, I said, leaning on a chair to catch my breath. The room was deadly silent except for the sound of my own ragged breathing. Everyone was looking at me like they didn't believe a word. Their silent accusations of overexcited tourist with an overactive imagination echoing in the silence. But I saw her. I'd seen the lady of Jerome Grand, and she was as real to me as the cold, biting wind outside. Here's the deal. I started that tour loving all those old stories and really wanting to see something strange. But the true belief comes only when you see it, when you sense it, and they hadn't. And so, while I knew what I'd encountered, they returned to their secure bubble of skepticism. But telling them what happened, that was important to me. Despite the mixture of reactions, disbelief, skepticism, and a smidgen of fright, I felt validated. I'd crossed the threshold from hearing stories to a part of one myself. It's weird how the stuff you don't expect can really hit you hard. In the aftermath, do I regret it? Not in the slightest. It was a revelation of sorts. It was like I'd stepped into the unknown, like I'd actually connected with a ghost or something. I'd walked in expecting a tour and walked out with a story I'd tell for the rest of my life. Oh, and my interest in ghost hunting. It's definitely gone up a notch. I'd realized that ghosts, like us, have stories to tell, and I'm looking forward to hearing about and hopefully meeting more of them. Fear, after all, is just a state of mind. I've been a park ranger at Ohio Pile State Park in Pennsylvania for seven years. Ohio Pile is a hidden gem in southwestern PA, surrounded by lush foliage with miles and miles of hiking and biking trails. I love the crisp morning air here and how the sun shines through the trees. It just feels more alive than sitting in front of a computer all day. All the money I spent on my forestry degree, totally worth it as far as I'm concerned. I'll happily take bears over office complaints any day. Anyway, the event I'm about to share happened last summer, right in my neck of the woods. It actually started out as a regular day, an inspection day. We routinely check on the campsites, making sure folks are following the rules, picking up after themselves, and not causing any harm to wildlife or the environment. It's mostly routine stuff, like meeting campers and answering any questions they might have. So, one early morning I just grabbed my usual stuff, a notepad for writing up violations, my flashlight, extra batteries, a park map for any new folks, and of course, my canteen filled with black coffee. There was a slight chill in the air, which isn't uncommon, even in the heart of the summer. I hopped in my truck and drove towards the eastern end of the park, where we had a few registered sites. I spent most of that day alone, far from any bustle, it was peaceful, no loud tourists, just the wind rustling the leaves and the distant rush of the river. I loved the quiet, walking from campsite to campsite. Everything was as usual. The only excitement was telling a couple about the no fire outside of rings or grills, rule. Other than that, just leaves rustling, crickets chirping, and a squirrel who was totally ignoring me. Towards dusk, I was nearing the last campsite on my list. It had been reserved but was currently unoccupied. It was a little secluded. You had to walk a bit off the beaten path to get to it. As I walked closer to the site, that's when things began to get odd. I couldn't really pinpoint what it was at first. Maybe a change in the air, less bird song, just an underlying tension. But I didn't really notice it at first. Only in retrospect after everything happened. I had another 50 yards to go when suddenly this smell hit me. It was this awful, eye-watering stench, like nothing I'd smelled before. It was like burning plastic mixed with sulfur, really strong and weird. As a ranger, you get used to all kinds of odors, from fresh pine to the stinky remnants of a skunk passing by. But this? This was completely alien to me, and right then I heard a thud. It sounded like something heavy had just dropped from a tall tree. It was a sound I'd never heard before. My heart started beating faster. I was both nervous and curious. Should I keep checking the campsite or just get out of there? I had to make a choice. I chose curiosity, or maybe it chose me. Trust me, 
Being a park ranger isn't always as easy as people think. My ranger instincts told me something was wrong. I stood there waiting, listening. I could still smell that awful stench. My throat tightened as I strained to hear anything. Anything that could tell me what the hell was going on. Then it hit. This sound. It was a terrible sound. The worst I've ever heard. It was such a sharp screech that it cut right through the forest sounds. The sound made my skin crawl, like a howl straight out of a horror movie. It echoed through the woods, hung in the air for a bit too long, then suddenly stopped. I instinctively crouched down, looking around, and then I caught a quick movement, a passing shadow, from the corner of my eye. It was big, but the setting sun and the thick foliage didn't offer me much else to go on. But what I saw made no sense. My mind was trying to fit the image I had caught. A glimpse too fast, too unbelievable. It was almost like a bat, but much bigger, and those flashing yellowish eyes. Just that image was enough to chill me to the bone. Growing up around here, we all heard stories about the Jersey Devil. Dismissed as folklore, nightmares turned into bedtime stories. But there I was, in the fading light, with that weird smell and the echo of that screech, watching that figure vanish. It felt like I was in some weird story. I stood there terrified and shocked, my heart pounding in my ears. It was just a few seconds, but it felt longer before I could think straight again. I was shaking all over, scared out of my mind as I ran to my truck. I never looked back, not once. I'm pretty sure I broke every speed limit getting out of those woods. By the time I got to my cabin, my throat was raw from all the hard breathing, and I was shaking as I drank some water. I sat in my living room for a while, just silent. Can't shake off the image of those strange eyes and that huge shadow. The next day, I went back to the site, but I found nothing that could explain what unfolded the previous evening. Just damp earth and the whispering trees. I expected to hear the customary sing-song of the birds, comforting and familiar, but there was nothing, just silence, as if all life had retreated into hiding. Or maybe it was just my perception that had changed. For days I struggled, trying to make sense of it all, my logic against what I saw and heard. That day has haunted me to this day. If I had seen what I thought I saw, if I had come face to face with something terrible from the folklore, it's a bizarre reality to live with. But I reckon, sometimes, the darkness within the woods is darker than we think. And when you step into the deep woods, you might find yourself lost in its mysteries. I'm a ranger at Yellowstone National Park, right near where Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho meet. It's a huge place, full of geysers, hot springs, and the famous Old Faithful. It was late in the day, time for us rangers to start securing the area. Tourists get caught up in all the sights and lose track of time. For example, as dusk approaches, I have to make sure the boardwalk around Old Faithful is clear. You see, the park can feel quite different when cloaked by darkness. Even people from the city can feel it. The park seems different when it gets dark. There are all sorts of stories about the park, like vengeful spirits, strange animals, and voices in the wind. But after years here, that kind of stuff never really got to me. After all, I always thought these stories were just for scaring visitors around a campfire. But that day, I was about to see something really unexpected. I was following my standard routine, walking along the boardwalk I had trodden countless times. The hisses and gurgles from the hot springs and geysers almost sounded like they were talking, but I was used to their noises. I found it comforting. I kept my eyes on the boardwalk, looking for any tourists still around. I was really focused until I saw a silhouette in the distance. There was someone standing too close to the edge, right near Old Faithful, which is not allowed at all. This being was on two legs, with big shoulders and maybe a tail. The profile was human, but not entirely. I called out, my shout echoed through the quiet, and then suddenly there was this low, rough growl. It sent a shock of fear through me which was a sensation that was foreign to my years of working in the park. This was the moment when my rational mind gave way to instinct, signaling danger. 
That shock, plus the day getting darker, made everything feel a lot scarier. Being a ranger, you're told to be prepared for various encounters, but deep inside, you're never really conditioned for an unexpected one. As I moved cautiously closer, flashlight sweeping, my mind raced, trying desperately to piece the vague features of the creature into something familiar, something I could understand. My breath hitched as the figure shifted. Its silhouette morphed, changing into a form that was not ordinary human anatomy. It was then I noticed the head, too angular to be human, more like a reptile. Those myths that I never believed in suddenly started to feel real. A sudden burst of steam from Old Faithful tarnished my view. The atmospheric pressure shifting and echoing, the silent tension woven through the air. It was almost as if the forces of nature were both signaling and masking what lay in wait. And this was when the dusk-drenched silence started to feel heavy. It was turning out to be anything but a routine park patrol. As the steam cleared in the night's chill, I saw it more clearly. The creature was huge, just unfolding in front of me. Its eyes were bright, really yellow and kind of calculating, staring down at me from its weird V-shaped head. It looked sort of human, but only at first glance. Looking at it straight on was dizzying, scary but somehow fascinating too. I stepped back fast, my heart thumping loud, almost like the geysers around me. My instincts screamed danger, but an odd fascination kept my feet rooted to the ground. It had these huge black claws, and it moved so smoothly, which was weird against the straight lines of the boardwalk. In that moment, I felt like it was watching me, outsmarting me. It was like it knew more than I could even understand. This was way scarier than any ranger's nightmare or campfire story. So tall, so utterly foreign, and so menacingly present, I could barely breathe. I kept backing away but couldn't take my eyes off it. I couldn't help but feel its gaze following my every move, with a sadistic interest that sent shivers down my spine. I neither confronted nor ran, but retreated, compelled by a primal urge to put a safe distance between the formidable unknown and myself. Finally, after what seemed like eons, I reached my ranger station, taking one last look over my shoulder, and there it was, the figure, quiet and ever foreboding, sinking back into the Yellowstone wilderness under the cloak of the night. The natural hum of the park picked up again, the silence broken, indicating the ordeal was over. That night was no peaceful slumber, and no subsequent night was either. The encounter changed everything. Now, every rustle of leaves or breaking twig puts me on alert. The park which was once my sanctuary became a vast mystery, holding secrets far terrifying than I could have ever imagined. Retelling this, I find myself questioning its reality, the strange encounter playing tricks on my seasoned mind, the way twilight plays tricks with shadows. Yet, the image of the creature, its yellow eyes still burning brightly against the dark backdrop of my memory, it lingers. I cannot decide what was worse, the encounter itself or the aftermath. Both have not just put the park, but also my very sense of reality into question. Ever since, on patrol, I keep looking into the trees, drinking too much coffee on night shifts, trying to convince myself it was just stress or a weird story. But one thing for sure has been carved into the bedrock of my life. I have witnessed the extraordinary. I've touched the fears stowed deeply into my rationality, and it now seems a colossal task to reclaim the sense of peace and order. Maybe Yellowstone was always like this, and it's just the way I see it that's changed. Either way, Yellowstone isn't just another national park for me anymore. It holds something far more profound, something that speaks of the world's hidden wonders, and perhaps its hidden terrors. I still remember that chilly night in September a few years ago, driving late at night through the bayous of Louisiana. Honestly, it still gives me goosebumps. Why was I there, you ask? Looking back, I wonder the same thing. But sometimes you just need a break from all the chaos. Living in busy New Orleans, I wasn't used to much peace. 
After a few sleepless nights due to stress and worry about my job, I just decided to go for a drive through the swamps. Now, Bayou Tesh in the nighttime is eerie. There was a bit of light pollution making the sky above eerie, and the dark silhouette of the eastern horizon added to the chill. The cool wind blew through the open car windows wrapping around me. I had opened the window to try and wake up a bit. I also resorted to my favorite pastime, listening to some Creole blues. The sweet sounds of the blues was a good combination with the haunting atmosphere of the bayous. My eyes steadily drifted from the road to the car clock display, which was ticking its way to midnight. While lost deep in thoughts, my vehicle's headlights illuminated something by the side of the road. Instinctively, I slammed on the brakes, coming to a complete stop. What looked like a naked man huddling by the road was now pressed up against the bottom of a grand cypress tree looking straight up. Its elongated body awkwardly twisted. Its skin looked weirdly pale under the car's headlights. I grabbed the flashlight from the glove box, my heart racing. Then, this weird clicking noise started filling the air. It was like the rapid-fire, raspy chirping of a nocturnal insect, only deeper a whole octave lower than the chirping of a common swamp cricket. I got chills as I grabbed the flashlight and opened the car door, not really knowing what was out there. I tried to sound brave as I yelled into the dark, but my voice was shaking. But inside, I was more than just scared. I was terrified. This isolated drive was turning into a nightmare, and my adventurous idea now seemed foolish. It's hard to describe what happened next. The creature uncoiled from its strange pose and started crawling on all fours, but not like a person would. It moved fast, more like an animal. It was moving in an awkward pattern though, almost as if it was looking for something in a crazy zigzag pattern. I'm not even sure if it noticed me, by the way it was so intently moving around. Its eyes glowed in the dark, empty of any human feeling, and that clicking sound it made, it was just creepy. In an instant, I lost my voice. All I could do was stand there rooted to the spot, the flashlight beam shaking as it illuminated that grotesque figure. I've seen weird things before, but nothing like this. This creature wasn't a man. Nothing resembling a human could move like that. I could see clearly when my car's headlight beams fell on the creature. Its eyes were huge and pitch black, shining like some wild animals in the moonlight unnerving to say the least. The rest of its face was all wrong too. No nose I could see, just an open mouth gawking back at me. It looked like something out of a nightmare, half human, half something else. Still gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. And that clicking sound, growing louder and closer, was like something straight out of a nightmare. I could hear it, that noise echoing in my ears as if taunting me and within seconds the creature was gone, disappeared into the undergrowth, leaving just the faint trace of its chilling clicking sound in the air. I was frozen, just like a deer in the headlights. Maybe the thing had found what it was looking for. My brain was drawing blanks. My body almost refused to move, adrenaline rushing, heart pounding. I jolted back to reality, jumped into my car and locked the doors. I must have sat there for a good five minutes before I turned the car around and drove away. Just thinking that thing might be close by was enough to scare me stiff. I could not shake off what I had just witnessed for quite some time. I didn't think I was scared easily, but the encounter with that creature had completely rattled me. To say that I was questioning my sanity would be an understatement. In the following days, I found myself unable to shake the image of that creature's haunting gaze or the sound of its raspy clicking. The peace and quiet I used to love now felt creepy, like anything could be hiding out there. Deep down, I knew it wasn't human, but part of me kept trying to make excuses, trying to find a way that it could have been a human, just so that I could get some answers. Eventually, after much research, I heard about crawlers, pale, gaunt creatures that crawl on all fours, associated with strange clicking noises. There were other stories I found too, other witnesses to these things, and the people who told them were alone and scared too, just like me. They also sounded very sure about what they'd seen. Their stories, even though they were terrifying, 
gave me a strange sense of comfort. I wasn't alone now, and I knew then that what I had experienced wasn't simply a bad dream, but something totally real. This happened a few years ago, in late November around dusk, at a place called Gooseberry Falls State Park, Minnesota. That place is something else if you've never been there. Waterfalls, a river gorge, real picturesque stuff. I lived in Duluth then, an hour from the park. I'd go there for some peace, especially when my apartment building got too noisy. That park was my escape from the daily grind. But that day felt off, like the calm before a storm. The sunlight was fading, throwing long shadows through the trees. I wandered the trails with my binoculars and bird guides, taking in the autumn colors and the sound of the falls. Apart from the weird feeling, it was a decent day. Got the feeling that day that I wasn't alone. I was hoping to spot a woodpecker or something, but definitely not what I did end up seeing. I was crossing this bridge over the river, watching the water flow below, minding my own business and wondering what the little ripples in the water meant for the fish. In that park, you find yourself thinking about everything, even fish. Anyway, as I was crossing that bridge, I started to smell something really off. Now, I'm a plumber, and I've sniffed some rank stuff in my time, but this was on a whole other level. It was a stale, acrid smell that really turned my stomach, like rotten meat left in the sun for days. It was like the smell of death, something rotting in the forest. It permeated the air around me then, masking the scent of pine and damp earth. I looked around, trying to find the source of the stench. There wasn't anything nearby, nothing that I could see anyway. The woods around the path seemed normal, quiet, peaceful even. In hindsight, perhaps it was too quiet. Anyway, the smell didn't fade, but I thought, I thought it might have been some dead animal rotting nearby. I decided to push on, keep hiking. I was out there for the beauty, despite that revolting interruption. So, I'm walking down the trail, trying to breathe through my mouth, and the sun's sinking lower, and this dense shadow falls over everything. The park gets creepy in the dimming light, with shadows making strange shapes. It adds a tinge of otherworldliness to the forest. To distract myself from getting spooked, I started trying to identify the bird calls I was hearing. The one still awake. It was a long shot, but it kept my mind off things, and I don't know why I realized it. It must have snuck up on me, but at some point there, the smell vanished. But as the smell faded out, this feeling crept on. This kind of prickly sensation at the back of my neck, you know, like I was being watched. Suddenly, as I turned a bend in the trail, there it was, hulking on the face of the cliff about 50 yards away. It was unnaturally tall, taller than a small tree, maybe nine feet or so. In the dim light, its body looked emaciated, skin tight on bones, with a deer's head on top a skull-like deer head complete with an antler crown. I froze in my tracks, binoculars dropping against my chest. Then it hit me. This was like those Wendigo legends from campfire stories. A beast man with the head of a deer, driven by insatiable hunger. Those stories were just to scare us kids, right? Not something that should have been staring back at me, real as life. But there it was. Glowing yellow eyes locked onto me from within those skull sockets. The prickling on my neck turned into outright panic. I didn't know whether to run away screaming or to keep absolutely still, like a bird in the presence of a snake. I felt a chill of fear and shivered. I ducked behind a large tree, heart hammering. I held my breath so long I started getting dizzy. After what felt like forever, it got even darker. I dared to take a peek around the tree trunk and the hulking figure was gone. I couldn't see it anymore. That didn't ease my dread, but I knew that it was my only chance. I grabbed my flashlight, turned it on, and started jogging, then running back to the parking lot. When I finally reached my car, I jumped in, slammed the door, and drove out of there as fast as I could. That smell hit me again, making me gag as I drove off, but it faded as I left the park behind. I've since returned to normal jobs, different things. I've been back to the woods, 
telling myself it was all in my head, just a legend getting to me. I even moved to the edge of town to get further away. But through all of this, I can't shake the feeling of those cold yellow eyes watching me from the deep dark woods. I can't shake off the possibility that the Wendigo is still out there, and it had marked me. Every time I remember that day, I still get the chills.